and welcome to another edition of Philosophy in Motion. Today, we are honored and excited to have A.B. Crane here joining us. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. How are you today? I'm doing really well, Kelly. Thank you for having me. I'm really excited about this. And um, yeah. Well, um, tell us a little bit about yourself, what you do your likes, your don't likes, anything that you feel comfortable sharing with us, lay it on the table. <laughs> oh, great. So yes, I, um, I'm a writer. Uh, I also do uh, collage art and I dabble in keyboards. I'm not too trained on that, but I just do that for fun. And uh, my focus, uh, my intellectual focus um, is in uh, sociology and economics. And uh, I really enjoy modeling uh, new edu I think our what our world needs is new models in education, entertainment, uh, and economy, new entrepreneurial opportunities. So a lot of my writing uh, focuses and centers around analyzing current uh, situations in the economy and education models, and I innovate new ones. So um, basically, that's what I do. And I use the mediums of art, uh, collage art, digital collage art, um, infographic, uh, writing. I read a lot on uh, economics, philosophy, sociology, anthropology. So my main vision is trying to look at economy through the lens of the anthropologist, uh, the historical framework, and the psychologist and the sociologist, and kind of synthesize uh, a lot of Western philosophy and Eastern philosophy. So I guess I get around a lot uh, and pretty diverse in, in what I read and research. So it's, it's a lot of fun and it, very interesting. So uh, right now I'm working on a book. Um, it's uh, very research intensive uh, called The Holistic Integrationist, Economic School of Thought for the 21st Century. So I just feel that we need um, a new vision of economy that's not so polarized to either the laissez-faire side or the Keynesian uh, government interventionist socialist side. So. Yeah, basically, uh, that's that's what I'm doing. <laughs> so, you you, I told you to lay it on the table, and you laid a feast. Oh. <laughs> <on the table. laughs> yeah. I love all these avenues of thought. You are, please, please make yourself at home. Um, I I dig all of that, and LCP is all about all that you just said, connecting all these mediums and and genres uh, and thought patterns together into one message. Yes, yes, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly. Oh, yeah. Let's get down with this interview then. Now that you've laid it on the table, I'm, I'm even more excited. <laughs> about that. Um, so how would you describe your highest advantage? Well, I, I thought about that question. Um, I think my personal highest advantage is ironically uh, what I lack, uh, and that would be career ambition. <laughs> um, I think that uh, this lack eventually opened up the space, though, for uh, it was it started out like as a like a vague latent inkling of what was to come even in early childhood but uh sort of a higher calling or sort of a personally defined ambition so my lack of uh ambition that, that kind of defined by the institutions of society uh can then be seen um my personally defined ambition uh became a substitute for that uh and i always felt the uh, the economy and the culture to be so artificial, arbitrary, uh, meaningless version of the, this meaningless version of ambition uh, presented me uh, by these societal institutions, education, religion, family. Um, so it was always a fish out of water in a culture and economy of material excess. I think that's what bothered me most of uh, modern consumerism. And as it, as it followed, neither did I fit into the work culture necessary to maintain what I felt to be a hollowed out dead experience of life. So I did attempt other avenues uh, for a while, like nonprofits appealed to me for that reason, but I found that many were steeped in a poverty consciousness. I've come to find out uh, entangled in a lot of red tape that also did not appeal to me very much, heavy administration, um, it just didn't resonate with my vision for what I thought the world could be. I, I remember in the early 2000s, a young woman, uh, she was talking to me and she told me that she worked in a nonprofit that served to help the poor. And ironically, she bent it to me that she shares a studio with like three other women her age, like in her 20s. 
And she just was like, it's hard for me to, I have to quit. I, I can't come up with food, uh, food expenses. This is a nonprofit serving for now. I don't think all nonprofits are like this. Um, and at the other extreme, I worked at a nonprofit once where the director was making 300,000 a year. So there was a, a lot of, you know, anger and angst about that within, within the company. Um, so my inner voice always seemed to be repeating this thought that if only the world could simultaneously transcend toxic consumer culture of excess and also this other side of the coin, uh, this poverty consciousness, uh, there must be a third more balanced approach to addressing our economic and cultural needs um, that are more authentically proactively, uh, more authentic and more direct. And so instead of forging a, uh, personally forging an upwardly mobile career path in a narrow field, uh, I worked many jobs in numerous industries, nonprofits, restaurants, disabled care, working with like all classes, ages, people from all backgrounds. And uh, I even worked supervisor jobs, union jobs. So I, I was able to study, and I guess this is a, a, a personal advantage. Um, I studied the economy from the inside out, not only from books, but I think importantly from direct experience. So um, this, and then this finally led to my envisioning of new models of economy, education, and entertainment that they, they were free of the conspicuous conspicuousness in both consuming and giving um, that were much more authentic and in, in what Marx calls your, our species essence. Uh, Thorstein Veblen uh, published a book in 1899 called Theory of the Leisure Class, and he talks about conspicuous charity and, and, and conspicuous consumerism that started with like barbarian invasions. So he traces it uh, pretty far back. Um, and then I've read other books uh, that uh, spoke of this. So um, we needed new models uh, where we can be less obsessed with this robotic impressing each other uh, as careers and consumers, and then um, which would be more naturally organically expressive in our unique uh, creativity and talents. So. Okay, that's, that's a fantastic answer. I, and it leads right into the next one, but I do want to pause a little bit. I, I want to admire uh, your answer, how it, it, um, it, it stemmed out of this lack, out of this, out of this need. And then I just love how you, you filled it. You, you know, embody your own message, transcending this, this personal uh, feeling and motivation to look at these societal uh, connections uh, and these more universal connections uh, and, and, and draw yourself towards that and, and make a change. Just sort of drag the rest of the world with you <laughs> on this ride. Um, so uh, how, how is it that you, do, you believe that this personal highest advantage uh, is connected to this universal or at least a more common uh, notion of humanity and our highest advantage? Well, I thought about that. Uh, that's very, very great question. Um, I'm not sure that there is such a thing as a universal notion of uh, humanity's greatest advantage, uh, except maybe in smaller groups, fringe groups, uh, who might have a common cause or agenda. Um, people are so diverse. And I think one man's prison uh, just may be another man's greatest sense of freedom sometimes, uh, or, or maybe their sense of achievement as well. So I always found that the most fundamental glitch in democracy are these very vastly differing notions of what freedom and success mean to different people. So that said, though, I do think there are things that are universally uh, desirable, uh, that people want basic necessities, of course, love, sexual fulfillment, friendship, meaningful work, and enough leisure time. One thing we lack in this world is enough leisure time so we can enjoy all, all of those things authentically. So it may be that, uh, I think human ingenuity is our highest advantage. Uh, what, I, what I saw was not a lack of uh, human ingenuity in general, but more so was the, what was missing was a sturdy, efficient, organized framework where we can actually truly maximize that human ingenuity. So my higher calling at first was a more vague notion uh, of wanting to do something to help heal myself and others and to contribute to more authentic communities, uh, perhaps, but 
um, a new, more dynamic, life-affirming models in education and entertainment. I keep, sorry, I keep repeating that. I keep going back to that, but all this uh, soon blossomed into a, a very structured framework, a structured vision. Maybe even you could call this a matrix or a map. Uh, and so I crafted a series of digital collages, business plans, and books on my socioeconomic vision, which I call Project Integrity International. And this culminated in a very structured nuts and bolts plan and platform for this more vague, uh, previous more uh, vaguely experienced yearning to be of some kind of use to humanity uh, and the earth. Uh, so I saw there were numerous books and concepts, uh, uh, the flood at the internet and all kinds of libraries and, and they expressed great sentiment for world change and even solutions such as uh, you see political action, vote this way, vote that way, or charitable causes. But I did not see a direct, cohesive, tangible results oriented brick and mortar kind of strategy for these changes that are ever so critical. And so I set out to devise this uh, blueprint. Okay, that's great. And it, it sort of draws, uh, draws me back to what we were saying before we before I pressed record. Uh, just uh, finding that space uh, uh, internally, uh, 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 getting beyond the guilt of taking a break after a big spurt of, of executing and making deadlines and teaching and running around all over the place. Um, that internal struggle is very real and manifests itself you know, in, in everyday life. So I'm wondering how do your everyday practical endeavors serve the achievement of your personal highest advantage? Um, and how are you tying that into uh, uh, these, these structures that can give others the space to explore their own personal highest advantage and maybe compare and contrast or set, them, set us up to be in a position where collectively we can compare and contrast our highest advantages and, and how we can integrate a space for everybody's highest advantage uh, in our material reality together. That was a, that was a very loaded question. No, <laughs> I, I, I love it. It's great. It's a great question, Kelly. Um, my vision, uh, so Project Integrity International in a nutshell, is a unique franchise model that I designed to organize and accelerate a branded, um, like a connected network of sustainable worker on cooperatives. Um, and they build and bridge economic opportunity, social justice, environmental health, and strong support of communities. So it's, a, it's, it's more of a, uh, a sturdy, tangible platform. Um, so PI is sort of the mother company with a, a diversified product and service line that will meet all the kinds of basic needs. Um, with natural disasters, we obviously need disaster resistant housing, uh, such as like what Buckminster Fuller would have developed with his GD sick domes, healthy food, natural clothing lines. And so to make this manifest, every day I engage in um, my craft, which is writing art, video production, uh, and the nuts and bolts of running my own self publishing company as a start. Um, but I do want to launch the first prototype. So I recently wrote a screenplay called The Franchise, A Case Study and the Will to Power. <laughs> and um, I want to launch this as a performer owned cooperative uh, production film company. And so everyone would get an equal cut. Um, we would produce it ourselves. Everyone would get an equal cut um, as worker owned cooperatives do you know, film directors, actors, makeup artists, costume designers, editors, what have you. Um, so that would be, I think, a, an excellent place to create this community around this. And then if other writers come into the mix, we can produce other movies. Uh, this movie introduces, uh, it surrounds, um, uh, it's a coming of age drama that centers around a group of college friends uh, and their eccentric professors uh, who are graduating into a terrible recession. And in, in the course of the, uh, they struggle working at a fast food place and they don't like it because it's toxic food and they're getting treated like crap. And so um, the movie takes an interesting twist where they actually envision the project integrity model of franchising. And then they actually, towards the end, launch uh, the first prototype cooperative. Um, and that, that idea for the business that they launch um, can actually be 
a real life cafe. It would be an organic cafe that serves uh, teenagers as an after school program where they teach them entrepreneurial skill development, healthy nutrition, art. They, ha they have their own uh, art on the walls and crafts and um, all kinds of poetry reading, poetry slams, music events. So I'm trying to model in the fiction, fictionalized movie what it could be in the reality. Plus that would also serve as the cooperative, uh, the first prototype cooperative. I would hope the second prototype cooperative would be the cafe, I call it cafe generation, which would be the, uh, the cafe slash teen after school program. So and if, if this is launched in a low income area, the, the kids would be getting really healthy food entrepreneurial skill development and uh, I guess emotional intelligence uh, would be part of that uh, social uh, how to how to communicate with others uh, uh, professionally and uh, and organically I guess so yeah <laughs> I know there's a lot <laughs> um, so I guess I'm trying to sorry <laughs> no just left and right you embody your message and that's the most efficient way uh, to uh, uh, align your everyday endeavors with, with that higher meaning and, and to, to really carve out a space where it can emerge and, and uh, uh, be fleshed out and made real, that idea, uh, this ideal world that is. Um, and I really appreciate how education is, is part of that vision. Not only are you carving out a space for you to explore and make manifest your highest endeavor, or, or, or sorry, uh, advantage and and um, and such, <laughs> you are actively showing how others can do that as well, and giving them a space where they can carve out, and you can, you know, carve together uh, a space where this reality can be made manifest. So I just, I think that's wonderful. Oh, thank you so much. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Um, so how do you uh, come to know the basic patterns of the mind and of human experience? And, and what's your point of access to those patterns? So switching gears a little bit. <laughs> no, I, I love it. Um, uh, so I guess I, I am an innovator. And uh, so years, I'll just, uh, I guess I'll tell this with a, vid, a personal vignette. Years ago, um, for some reason, I don't know why, a mandala appeared in my mind's eye. And it was a mandal of all words. Um, so I sketched it out. It was like an oct octagon. And uh, this mandala soon came to not, uh, not only be my personal mapping in the mind, but a daily practice, um, again, bridging theory and practice. Uh, and um, I call this WISER, W-I-S-R, which stands for Wave Image Symbol Reality. Um, and for me, it was a map of the human psyche and consciousness. So my personal method uh, practice involves engaging in the creative activities on a daily basis. Um, so for example, walking meditation and swimming meditation and playing musical keyboards would activate and nurture the intuitive wave state. And then um, switching over to activate the five physical senses in the right hemisphere, um, I would use the visual art and in infographic design to activate and develop the imagination uh, waves, uh, sorry, image state, the physical senses. And then finally, the nonfiction writing research and reading activate, tend to activate and refine the reasoning analytical symbolic state. And then this was interesting because I recently read a very lengthy book, a brilliant work by uh, Lane McGilchrist. He was a, uh, he's a neurosurgeon, but he is deeply inspired by the works of Nietzsche, Hegel, very well read in philosophy, extraordinary genius and uh, humanitarian, in my opinion. And uh, he also is very interested in uh, the art movements. So his book, uh, The Master and the Emissary, uh, it resonated with my wiser vision. It's a, I would call it a sort of genealogy that traces periods in history, whereby either a left brain dominant reductionistic fragmented worldview or a more holistically integrated understanding of the world experience um, sort of our integrated place within societies and the natural environment have dominated. Very interesting thesis. So he provides numerous examples of how this is reflected in artistic movements, science, and philosophy. It's just extraordinary. And he emphasizes that when the left brain has taken over the driver's seat, um, has become the master, uh, 
how this truly limited humanity and our ability and willingness to be empath uh, empathic and creative. So my wiser model, uh, as I've experienced in daily practice, seems to activate and connect the hemispheres um, in, as relates to Lane McGilchrist's work. And in turn, it, it enables me to achieve a holistic understanding of human social and economic epidemics to devise equally informative like solution and equally informed solutions. Um, and it's just, uh, I would say some of the results for me personally is yielded an amazing ecstatic life experience. Uh, I, I get really high and I know as you're a drummer with, with the music where that brings you. Um, initiated a deep healing of personal traumas uh, which I've had many, <laughs> uh, fostered deep bonds with other creative folks such as yourself and just fantastic friends who have been my greatest support system. Uh, then of course I've yielded physical manifestations like books, musical works and art. Um, and then again, it inspired uh, the new models of, of economy education that we've already discussed, uh, entertainment um, that I share with, you know, through publications or discussions. So. Yeah, um, and I think that's pretty much the, the model that I use. And I, uh, I want to, with Cafe Generation, I want to introduce this as well. So that I want every person there uh, who's interested to know that um, how the parts of their brain relate to their life and how they can, um, like we do yoga to exercise the body, uh, music and to exercise the soul, uh, just to offer them so, so many experiences that it seems to me that the modern education system leaves out or ignores, or they present them in, in kind of a, a crude way uh, from what I've seen, unless you're fortunate to go to a charter school maybe. But so yeah, that's basically it uh, in a in a nutshell <laughs> but yeah uh no this uh that's fantastic i i have really enjoyed um hearing about your views of production and social connections and how uh that that grounds your understanding uh and it, it seems to me listening to this interview uh listening as i give it oh goodness um the divides uh to to um listen to you talk about how uh, creating art allows you to reflect through action on your uh, your motivations uh, and your needs uh, in this material space and 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 in producing this reflective uh, thing uh, you're able to uh, become to, to 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 really carve out your material material reality uh and a, and a closer resemblance to your vision uh and what it what it what what would be an optimal state for you to thrive uh and from that position you just um you know automatically are uh attuned to uh social connections through through that art form it's something that you could share uh and through which you can you can share ideas uh and and that art touches on uh the the multi-dimensional uh aspects of self upon which you can reflect you know activates that in the other and and really you can see others you know minds at work uh when when dealing with these productions uh, for those listening along at home uh ab crane has got some amazing artwork and and uh, if only I had a mirror to reflect on my face while uh, while uh, enjoying it, I, I'm sure I would I would be able to see my own mind uh, in my wheels a turning, um, and, and to see that a light in someone else, and and to build that bridge uh, with another, I think provides the foundation for um, for greater understanding for the for every party involved in that reflective sharing. Um, so sorry to go off on that tangent. Really no, it's beautiful. Very, very beautiful. Thank you. Thank you for your answer. My goodness. Um, so, so, so tying back these, these access points to the mind, uh, how it is uh, our everyday activity. Or, or, so now we're drawn back to the question of everyday activities and, um, uh, and how it is we can we can integrate that mind into this into this reality this medium with which we need to work uh, and and 
being able to model that reality off of our minds and oh so sorry anyways <laughs> i was just you got me so excited you got me so excited how do you make use of those patterns in your everyday practical endeavors <laughs> Um, <laughs> now that I've stopped rambling, go go ahead. <laughs> um, I I um, I I I guess it's just that what I manifest. Um, I I guess the next uh, manifesting the R in the music, but I think the next uh, phase is just um, trying to bridge and connect with others to collaborate at this point because it's really hard doing. So much working a full time job and doing all this on, on the weekend, as you know, and well, so it's uh, you become reclusive. Um, I live in uh, Sunnyvale, and it's not the most creative, outwardly creative community. Uh, you know, um, so I guess I I used to have more of that in San Francisco, but I I just feel like um, I'm making use of it in, in basically. Um, everyday creation uh but it's it's just about um helping uh, uh trying to get these out in the into collaborations and real world brick and mortar at this point uh brick and mortar um establishments <laughs> hate that word but yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, i know <laughs> double-edged sword kind of a word but yeah um so yeah basically i think that that's pretty much um where i'm at right now but I can, I can definitely uh, uh, I feel that and and can learn from from that making use of yours. Uh, that is that is something that I struggle with and trying to juggle. Uh, uh, yeah, my basic needs, make sure those are met and to to, um, to follow the, those my, my passions and 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 to actively create a better world or what i believe to be a better world um it's so draining and you you need that personal time to yourself but uh it can so easily turn into to isolation and that's yeah not, that's not good for the creative mind uh so you know how do you ethically make use of yourself oh goodness well if you're going to be making use of yourself you got to make sure that uh, uh that your productivity is directly tied to social unity and that you are carving a space where you can just be with other people uh, in a way that doesn't take away from uh, your activities of, of enacting your vision. Uh, creating yeah. like-minded people that aren't gonna drain you or, or make you feel like uh, you are taking away from your alone time by just being around them. I don't know. <laughs> you, you can, with like my people, I feel like you can be around them while still being alone. Uh, <laughs> That's <laughs> true. The right kind of people allow, allow you that space. And, um, and, and I do think the best vehicle will be like producing this, this drama movie. Um, I think that would just be the most fun I'll ever have had in my life. Um, if I if I move to New York City next year, um, that might happen if I get this grant I've applied for, and I could uh, maybe produce this in New York City, which I think would be a blast. <laughs> oh, so that's not far away, I would definitely. I know. Let me know. I will go to yeah. that. <laughs> you come to the auditions. <laughs> so, oh, that's of course. <laughs> So um, yeah, great. Well, A.B. Craig, thank you for this wonderful interview. It's so refreshing. Um, this will be, uh, you know, for those listening at home, we're, we're uh, recording this on New Year's Eve. It probably won't come out for a few more days, uh, but uh, what a way to start off the new year, 2022. Uh, with, oh, thank you. Uh, you thank know. you so much, Kelly. It's been a real pleasure and um, happy new year to you and everyone listening and uh, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I'll, stop, I'll stop recording after this. So thank you again. Oh, okay. Uh, and um, yes, I'm, I'm excited for what, what the world, what the, 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 I speak on behalf of the world. I'm excited. We are excited for what you uh, are about to bring to the table. If this is what, this is what what you bring to the table in just an interview. 
world watch out for the productivity behind it yes so i'm ah. i'm excited for things to come um and and thank you for for sharing sharing all your ideas with us today ah thank you for having me kelly it was a, a real pleasure thanks